what I want to do is just make sure that these audio clips are warped to the grid um, and that they're all the same length. I'm guessing they're all two bars. I'm just going to um, command and mute to quantize the audio. Yeah, that's two bars. That's two bars. And that's two bars. Right, okay. So they're all quantized. Um, and then I'm going to slice them to MIDI. So I'm going to do the first one. Remember a few weeks ago I showed you how to make your own slice to MIDI preset? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm not using the built-in preset. I'm using the one that I've um, called Jack because I'm not self-absorbed. Uh, and I'm going to do, do these all by 16th notes and preserve warp timing because I've warped the audio as well. Okay. So I'm going to do them all by 16th notes. Okay, um, so we've sliced all of these to MIDI now, so um, I can turn this off because I, I don't need to use these audio files anymore. Um, so what we've got is a succession of MIDI clips, which you guys remember sliced to MIDI, don't you? you, you it slices all the individual um, fractional note values or transients, depending on what you tell it to do, and then it inputs a MIDI note for every one of those things. So because of said 16th notes, and this is over two bars, each one of these MIDI notes takes up a 16th note amount of time. Um, so if we play the first, well that's the last one we did, we play the first one here. Sounds like that. It just plays, essentially plays through what was the original audio clip in order. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this first um, drum rack. Um, when, I say, when I say first, I mean the one that I sliced to MIDI first. So it's the furthest along to the right. I'm going to select it and I'm going to group it. What happens if you group a device? It's simpler than that. We looked at it earlier in the session. Let's put it into an instrument rack. Yeah? Okay, so, so we've now got an instrument rack here with one chain with a drum rack in it. So I'm just going to call that chain one. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all of the other drum racks and I'm going to cut them from their tracks and I'm going to paste them into this instrument rack. So that's called number two. And it's the drum racks I'm doing this with, remember. So I'm selecting the drum racks and then I'm pasting them into the instrument rack. So we're going to end up with an instrument rack with four drum racks inside it. There we go. And now I can turn all of those. I mean, I could delete these if I wanted to, but I'm just kind of minimizing them and putting them over here because this is the only, this is the only uh, track and clip I'm really interested in at the minute. Um, so if I hit play, okay. So I've got one clip, which it's the same. It was the same clip, wasn't it? It just runs through all of the MIDI notes in sequence. But that because we've got all of the drum racks inside one instrument rack, that's triggering every single sample that we've got in sequence. So we're, we're hearing all four simultaneously. All right, so now I'm going to go over and look at the chain list. Remember, we shift selected all of these before, drag those out to maximum, right click, distribute the ranges equally, and now what we've got is a method of um, filtering the incoming MIDI data through our different chains so that we hear a different drum rack depending on the position of the chain selector. Okay, so that's already pretty useful. Remember, you don't have to do this with drums, you can do it with anything you like. Um, Okay, so now I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate the first chain. So these two chains are exactly the same. Um, right click and distribute ranges equally again. Um, I'm going to drag this chain down to the bottom. 
Yes, I am. And I'm going to rename this one um, distortion. I'm going to do the same thing with chain two. Uh, duplicate it. It's taking a little while to think about this because it's got to copy all of the samples to new drum racks, etc. etc. Uh, I'm going to do the same with that. Drag it down to the bottom. And I'm going to give that one a new name, but I haven't decided which effect I'm going to put on it yet, so I'm not going to rename it yet. So on this chain here, what I want is some sort of distortion. I quite like the saturator. So remember we, we said before with instrument racks, if you want to add something to a chain, you can just drop it directly onto the chain in the chain list, like so. So now the chain one distortion has the original samples from number one, number one drum rack, if you like, but it's got a, a saturator effect after it. Um, tell you what I need to do, I need to right click and distribute ranges equally again so we've got the, all of these in separate zones and then number two, oh, I'll, I'll use a flanger, I was using a flanger before and I quite like that so that's number two and I'll rename that flanger alright so let's see what we've got now I think I need to make the uh, settings for this a little bit more extreme so we can definitely hear that it's doing its job. That's better. All right. All right, so that flanger there. Uh, it's a little bit loud. Okay, so I've got essentially four different drum loops that I can switch between. Actually, I was really stupid there. I said the flanger was loud and I changed the dry-wet control. There's a much easier way of, um, of sorting that out because I've got a chain mixer, haven't I? Here. Most of my 20s dancing music that sounded like that. Except twice as fast. About that fast. <laughs> Alright, so, um, and remember you can MIDI map this chain selector. So I'll MIDI map that there and then. Um, again, doesn't just have to be drums, it can be anything you want. Something simple that you could do is just start to generate different or new MIDI clips. Um, if we, if I just put some, because remember currently what we've got is we've got, um, yeah, it's just looping through as it originally was, wasn't it? So when, so we're, we're not changing anything in terms of what is triggered and when. That automatically sounds a little bit different, doesn't it? Um, remember those little MIDI editing tricks I showed you before? So um, why don't I duplicate this so we'll make it twice as long? And I duplicate the clip, and then the lower one down, I'll reverse it. Um, so we've got... We could duplicate it again and then inverse. So remember, inverse was the opposite to reverse, it kind of switches it vertically instead of horizontally. Okay, so MIDI editing, you can change, th you can change things up. Um, macros, we need to look at macros. 
Has anyone used macros before? Yeah, all right. Okay, so we, uh, I must have showed you that a while back. Yeah. Okay, also, has everyone seen macros? Oh, great. Okay, so I don't need to show you again. Um, so, <laughs> okay, all right. I'll just, we'll, we'll just do a brief one. We'll do a brief one. So, all right, someone... <laughs> Someone just in, uh, sum up in a, in one sentence. What can you do with macro controls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but that you so, you've gone one step further there, James, with MIDI mapping. Yeah, you've you've gone into MIDI mapping. But just a macro control in and of itself within the software, you're right. You can control multiple parameters with with one control. That's the idea with macros. But th those parameters have to be on devices which are inside something, either inside a drum rack, which has macro controls, or in this instance, inside an instrument rack. Now remember, in an instrument rack, you can have virtually as many chains as you want, within reason. I've never tried to max this out, actually, by the way. I've got other things to do. So I don't know how many <laughs> chains you can have, but I'm assuming there might be a limit at some point in Ableton to fall over. Nevertheless, whatever you have got inside your instrument rack, you can map to one macro. So say, for example, we wanted to map the... Uh, overdrive parameter um, so if we just hit map here we go into macro mapping mode this looks similar to MIDI mapping mode select the parameter and then hit map on macro 1 so we now control the overdrive on macro 1 that's fine but it's a lot more interesting if we then control this feedback control on the flanger as well so we go back into mapping mode and select the feedback control and then map it to macro 1 so now this macro one controls both the feedback control, so I've got up to full there, feedback's gone up to full, and it controls the overdrive on the saturator there. So if I turn the macro back down to zero, there it is, it's gone to as low down as it can be. The bit that James is talking about, um, if I go into MIDI map mode, I can now MIDI map this macro to one of these pots, I can do that. Um, now that we've got push, it's debatable whether you need to do that or not, really. Um, because if you select your instrument rack in your session, um, uh, why is that doing that to me? I don't want to edit my playing clip. You can um, just control the macro from, from this pot. Um, so you can do it either way. Um, let me just go back to MIDI, MIDI map that. Do you have to decide? You don't know. Um, it just when you select the instrument rack, it'll just be there. It just maps because it the push will um, automatically map what it deems the most important controls of whatever device you've selected onto those parts. Yeah. So if you select the instrument rack, macro one will be over there on the left. Um, all right. So there you go. So I've MIDI mapped macro one to this part here. So macro one is controlling the drive control. Uh, now, in order to be able to hear that, of course, I need for these two zones to overlap. Um, let's see what this is like. Tell you what, we'll go back to that. So we're getting a, a difference in the feedback in, on the flanger, but it's also getting more overdriven as well, isn't it? Because it's also controlling the other drive. Remember, we can invert. We can invert them. We can invert the ranges. So we could decide that um, as the overdrive uh, decreases, the feedback increases. So I've just switched. I've just switched the uh, minimum and maximum range on the overdrive there. So we'll get. Uh, this now. Okay. Um, so use of macros is definitely way, one way that you can develop this. Remember that um, you, you're not just dealing now though with top level instrument rack parameters. You've got, well we've got six drum racks here and drum racks have their own macros and drum racks have their own controls, filters, ADSR controls, etc, etc. And remember that you, if you wanted to, uh, you could put, let's find... 
Oh, I want to bring your attention to this button, by the way. Uh, this is the auto select button. So if I move the chain selector with auto select switched on, I just want you to notice what happens here. Can you see what's happening there? It switches between chains. Yeah, that's all right. So can you see um, there? That tells you which chain is selected. And which chain is selected governs what you'll see here. Yeah, because you'll see the whatever devices are on whichever uh, the chain that you've selected, you'll see over here. Um, so if you do, if you move the chain selector with auto select switched on, it'll automatically give you access to the devices which are on whichever chain you've selected. Okay, so you could choose, for example to put, I don't know, um, a saturator on slice one of that, of that drum rack. And now that's only on slice one. 